Well, good morning to all y'all. You know, in Texas, they say, hello, y'all. But if it's a group of people, they say, hello, all y'all. So <laughs> that's the message for this morning. No. <laughs> anyway, welcome here, whether you're tuning in from home or whether you've rode your horse over here today. Uh, we're so glad that you're here, and we hope that you enjoyed the message. And I've been looking forward to today's message because it's got some pretty deep stuff for us that's going to help us in, a, in our day-to-day -day lives. And uh, recently, we've been going through some problems, um, some um, medical problems with one of our grandsons. And, you know, it's tough. It's tough going through these things. And we're going to hear about it today. Um, but uh, do we have any country and western music fans out there at all? Oh, good. Hey, Donovan, are you going to play any country and western today? Okay, well, anyway, <laughs> there's a song uh, that Garth Brooks sings, and it's called Unanswered Prayer. And it goes something like, when you're talking to the man upstairs, uh, just because he don't answer doesn't mean he don't care. Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. So, I don't know if it's unanswered prayers or what it is, but uh, uh, Pastor will tell us about that today, and I just pray that the message today infiltrates your heart and your mind and your soul, and uh, let's worship together. Is that my cue? <laughs> You're welcome to stand and join us. Let the heroes rest Let the striving cease I lay down my crown Here at your feet I will trust here in the mystery. I will trust in you completely away my soul to say with your breath in me, I will worship. Yeah, you taught my feet to dance upon disappointment. I, I will worship. Let the weary rest Lift their eyes to see Your love crushing every lie Every doubt and fear I will trust here in the mystery. I will trust in you completely away my soul and to sing with your breath in me. I will worship. 
Yeah, you taught my feet to dance upon disappointment night. I will worship awake. Oh, awake my soul to sing with your breath in me. I will worship and you taught my feet to dance upon disappointment night. I will worship. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You are making all things new. 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 Hey, awake my soul to sing with your breath in me I will worship and you taught my feet to dance upon disappointment night I will worship awake my soul to sing with your breath in me I will worship and you taught my feet to dance upon disappointment night I will worship oh night I will worship and I I will worship Thanks for having me back. <laughs> it's good to see you all. Come and stand before your maker, full of wonder, full of fear. Come behold His power and glory, yeah, with confidence draw near. For the one who holds the heavens and commands the stars above is the God who bends to bless us with an unrelenting love. Rejoice! Come and lift your hands and raise your voice. He is worthy of all praise, rejoice. Sing the mercies of your King, and with trembling rejoice. We are children of the promise, the beloved of the Lord, one with everlasting kindness, but with sacrificial blood, bringing reconciliation to a world that longs to know the affections of a Father who will never let them go. Rejoice! Come and lift your hands and raise your voice. He is worthy of all praise. Rejoice. Sing the mercies of your King 
And with trembling rejoice And come and lift your hands and raise your voice He is worthy of all praise Rejoice Sing the mercies of your King And with trembling rejoice All our sickness, all our sorrows, Jesus carried up the hill. He has walked this path before us, He is walking with us still. Turning tragedy to triumph, turning agony to praise. There is blessing in the battle, so take heart and stand amazed, rejoice. When you cry to Him, He hears your voice. He will wipe away your tears, rejoice. In the midst of suffering, He will help you sing, rejoice. Come and lift your hands and raise your voice. He is worthy of all praise, rejoice. Sing the mercies of your King, and with trembling rejoice. faith will stand and I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am your you are mine Your grace abounds in deepest waters Your sovereign hand will be my guide Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed, but you won't start now. And I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. For I am yours, and you are mine. trust is without borders let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me 
Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. My faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. And take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. The Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. And take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. And I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise My soul will rest in your embrace For I am yours And you are mine Thank you. You can be seated. Thanks to Donovan and this team for leading us this morning. Let's pray together. Lord, we have just sung a prayer that you would lead us and call us out upon the water into deep places in order that our faith would be made stronger. Now that can just be lip service. That could just be a prayer. It's a cool sounding song. It has all the right ideas around it. But Lord, if we are brave, if we are risky, that can be a most profound and powerful prayer to pray. I wonder this morning, Lord, if we really mean it. I wonder if we really want to get out of the boat and step onto water. I wonder if we really want to push out into the depths. I wonder if we really want what it means to have our faith made stronger. Well, Lord, so often our prayers are prayed in ignorance. We we don't really know what it is that we are asking, but in faith we offer them, knowing that you know our hearts, and you know what you desire for us. And so in faith we do pray that prayer this morning. Thank you for this time of worship that we have together. We pray that you will continue to draw us together especially as we are not all able yet to be together in person. We pray, Lord, especially for those who are participating in worship online. We recognize that there are unique challenges to actually engaging in worship when looking at a screen. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would move this morning and engage all of us together in worship and that you would knit us together as one body 
So come, Holy Spirit, to this place, we pray. Fall on us afresh. Fill us anew. Lord, as we continue in worship, we desire to give a portion of what you have given us back in faith, in offering. Would you prepare our hearts, our minds to do that cheerfully and willingly, Lord? Would you break the hold that finances, that money, wealth has in our lives? Would you remind us that we rely on you for our daily bread and not the wealth that we accumulate and hoard? We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we have been praying, we want to extend you the opportunity to worship in that unique way through the giving of your tithes and your offerings. There's a variety of ways to give here at Northview, and they're on your screen. If you're not already signed up for pre-authorized, that's an option that you might consider. But we would encourage you to do some action of giving in order to engage your worship. And now Pastor Carol is going to do our announcements for us. Thank you very much, David. Well, good morning. Um, the first announcement is for all you seniors. And I spoke last week about the possibility of you might thinking that you might want to get involved with the seniors as you're getting older. And if you are, this would be a perfect event for you. And it's a little willy-nilly because the event is going to be a coffee time. It's going to be at the, on the grounds of Government House where there is a lot of shade. Um, it will be at 10 o'clock. You come, you bring your lawn chair, you bring coffee or whatever you'd like to drink, you bring snacks for yourself, whatever you'd like to nibble on, and you come to visit. The only thing that's not set is the date. Tentatively, April, or April, August the 17th, which is a week this Wednesday. But that, of course, is going to depend on the weather. And we'll confirm the date closer to the time. So watch your email for confirmation. And Margaret, I will call you so you will know. So I invite you to think about that. It's a perfect event if you just like to come and meet the seniors and find out who's there and see who you might connect with. So that's probably a week Wednesday, April the or August the 17th. And an advanced notice, the youth are being reminded to watch for the exciting opening. It's coming in September, and the date is yet to be announced, but keep your eyes open. Grades 6 to 9s, it'll be happening on Thursdays from 7 to 9, and grades 9 to 12 will be happening on Friday from 7 to 9, and I can just promise you it's going to be awesome, so keep watching. And our last, oh, our second last announcement has to do with the backyard party. The backyard party is at David and Sarah Schuhart's this week, and it starts at seven o'clock. Um, and David and Sarah want you to know they have a dog, a ten year, a ten month old dog that sounds, looks, is a puppy, sounds like a bull mastiff, and is totally friendly, and uh, will love you to death. So just be forewarned when you arrive that you may be swallowed whole. And lastly, this morning, the uh, kindergarten and below, so everybody from zero to kindergarten is going to be in their usual room in the West Wing, but everybody from grades one to five is going downstairs for something special. And I might tell you that if you're in more than grade five, like higher than grade five, but would really like to do something special, then head downstairs, because if you miss it, you're going to be so angry. Well, this morning I'm going to be reading our first scripture passage for the new series on the book of Jonah and um, I, I threatened I would slap Dave with a fish and if you know Veggie Tales, you know why I would slap him with a fish. If you want a really good version of, of Jonah, watch the Veggie Tales one because you get to slap people with fish. Anyway, <laughs> 
Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 16. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us, and we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord, because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, What should we do to make sure the sea, make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried to the Lord, O Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, O Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. The word of the Lord. Whoa. If you hear any drumming, that's just a special thing, so don't worry. We're not about to be attacked. Well, we're in a new sermon series. Last week, Pastor Carol finished off Prodigal God for us, and this week we're starting this new series in the book of Jonah called Fishtail. Now, I know that is a picture of a whale's tail, and I know that a whale is not a fish, but it all fit together, so just live with it. Okay, um, so our, our young people who have streaming and use their computers and phones for a lot of their television um, needs will never know what it is to have a show interrupted. A show that you have looked up in the TV guide, you have selected on your, your remote control, and you started to watch and all of a sudden you have some sort of a news announcement or a presidential address, or I always watch American TV, or something that would interrupt your show. If you're young, can you even imagine such a thing? Well, and what was really cool was at the end of the announcement, they would say, we now return you to our show already in progress. So they, they didn't pause what was going on, they layered something over top of it. So now you have missed key plot points in your show, and it was really awful. Well, something of the like is going on here with, uh, with Jonah and his story. Uh, when we come to Jonah's story that Sarah read for us so well, um, you get the sense that Jonah's story is already in progress. Uh, it sounds like things, it's just dropped on us. There's no setup. There's no kind of, here's who Jonah is, and here's where he lived, and here's what the life circumstances were like. Nope, just suddenly the word of the Lord came to Jonah. His story is already in progress. 
And that's an important thing to, for us to remember because Jonah's life, like our life, is just kind of in progress. Now, we know that Jonah is an Israelite. He is embedded with Israel's salvation history with their God. We also know that the book of Jonah is a part of kind of a subgroup in the Bible called the Minor Prophets or the Book of the Twelve. And so we kind of read these little uh, prophecies and prophets together. And we read it particularly in its order, chronological order. So Obadiah comes before Jonah. And in Obadiah's prophecy, we have this prophecy against Edom, where God is going to undo Edom and deliver Israel. He's going to punish these foreign, this foreign nation, and he's going to vindicate his people, Israel. And so all of that is going on in Jonah and in Jonah's life. Jonah has a set way of thinking. Jonah has an idea of how the world should be. Jonah has an idea of what his life is going to be like. He's all buttoned up. Everything is set for Jonah, and it's at that moment that the word of the Lord breaks in and calls him. This is similar to my own story. I've been reflecting this week about some of my own history. And I thought, especially for some of our new people, it might be helpful to hear a little bit of my story as well as we get to know each other and keep going deeper in, in community together. So I was 21 years old. I had just turned 21 years old. I had grown up with some churching, but it was a long time since I had anything to do with God. In fact, I had basically rejected God in my life. I had just turned 21, and my best friend John was turning 21 the next month. I was May, he was June. And in July, we were all set to head to Vegas to party, party, party. And it was at that moment that I had this overwhelming sense that I needed to go to visit my dad and his third family instead of going to Vegas. Kind of disappointing at the time, but... That impulse was there, and I obeyed it. Now, my dad was not somebody that I respected. He was not somebody that I wanted to hear about religion from. I had lived with him for one year. That was a big focus of uh, living together, and he used Christianity and religion as a tool to try and control me and manipulate me. So I really had no interest in any of that, and I had heard that he and his wife, Deb, had gotten back into this and were harassing all of my siblings with this stuff, too. So I thought I would go in with a strong defense by being offensive. Did that mic just cut out? All is well? Okay. Um, and so my plan going in was... I would just corrupt him from the minute I arrived. I, I would get him doing all the things that I knew that he would do, and I did. You know, I had him smoking and swearing and telling off-color jokes within about 10 minutes. It was great. And I thought I was safe from all of that. I figured once you expose the hypocrisy right up front, then you're kind of safe, right? Well, how's he going to give me a message? I didn't count on his wife, though. <laughs> and after dinner... Deb, who was sincerely pursuing this life, started just peppering me with questions. Now, my life was in progress. I was 21. I had no idea what I was going to do with my life, but I knew that I was going to figure that out. And it was going to be great, whatever it was. It was going to be so epic, so wonderful. I was pretty miserable at the time, but it was going to be wonderful. It's at this moment when my life is in progress, 21 years old, 
ready to take on the world, no real prospects, but there's real deep self-confidence that things were going to go my way. I was even a little bit religious. I mean, some of my friends and I would talk about these themes, and I kind of lived by a code, so I felt good about myself. But see, there's a difference between religion and faith. You see, in religion, and our friend Jonah was fairly religious. He was a part of this system. He had a theology about how life worked, and he was holding on to that pretty tightly. He was comfortable with where he was at, and so was I. But see, religion desires status quo. Religion desires us to be comfortable, and, and we who want the status quo and who want to be comfortable are just fine with being religious, have no problem with involving the gods in our lives, because the gods are really there in order to be a means to make us comfortable and to have a nice life. You know, we just cover all of our bases, spiritual as well as physical. And so the first thing that Jonah's story confronts us with is a question. The question of, are you settled into a status quo? Are you religious? Do you have a sense about God as you believe in God, that if you believe in God, if you make a space for him somewhere in your life, that he is there in order to make your life better or easier or happier? Is that a part of your life that is in progress this morning? In faith versus religion, when your faith is living, there's something very disturbing and unstable compared to religion. God is the living God, and he is disruptive. God has this awful habit all through Scripture and as testified by the lives of the saints, God is a God who disrupts the status quo. In preaching, we have a saying that says, preaching should um, comfort the disturbed, but it should also disturb the comfortable. That's a good summary for God. He disrupts the status quo in the living faith. Now, you know that I'm a big fan of Lord of the Rings, and the book that comes before Lord of the Rings is The Hobbit. The Hobbit introduces hobbits and lets us know that they are generally fat creatures that love their comfort. So it's quite common that you'll hear them talking about enjoying their second breakfast before tea, before lunch, before supper, <laughs> before tea. <laughs> And they love to smoke pipes, and sit on their porch, and greet one another. And that's kind of the opening scene of The Hobbit. When along comes Gandalf, a wizard. Now, most people, most hobbits, don't like wizards because wizards are tied up with adventures. And hobbits do not enjoy adventures because that is disruptive. It is uncomfortable. Well... You can read the book. Read the book. I mean, the movies are fun, but read the book, please. Gandalf marks out Bilbo for an adventure when Bilbo goes into his home, into his hole, thinking that he has escaped this brush with adventure. But in fact, 12 dwarves end up showing up on his doorstep, and Gandalf makes him a burglar, and they whisk him off on adventure. That's similar to what God does in our lives. We're comfortable. We enjoy the status quo. We like our first and second breakfast. 
Maybe we enjoy a pipe. Maybe we just enjoy our television and our job and our cars and our hotels and our vacations. We're comfortable. And we're not really looking to have that disrupted. And in fact, when adventure gets a little too close, we head inside. Well, Deb and my story function the same way that Gandalf did for Bilbo. She upset my status quo. I mean, it wasn't that life was perfect, but life was under control. I had the power to shape it the way I want. I could go where I wanted, when I wanted, do what I wanted, see who I wanted to see, avoid who I wanted to avoid. But she just kept on asking me questions about faith. And I was able to answer her, drawing on all my childhood Sunday school kind of material. But through her, God was disrupting 21-year-old David Schuhart, confronting me with his presence and demanding something of me. And what was really frightening was I didn't know what. What I did know is that the moment I had a sense of personal authority over myself, and as she pushed asking these questions, I could feel my grip on that starting to slip. To the point where I finally said, well, I'm going to go outside for a cigarette now. Right? Status quo, comfort. Nice, comforting cigarette. And I let a bat into the house, and my dad had to deal with that. God calls Jonah to go somewhere that he does not want to go, to do something that he does not want to do. The verbs that, that God uses, that the narrator uses is arise, go, call. Other prophets don't have to leave home. They can just stand on their own doorsteps and pronounce the prophecy against the nations. Other prophets don't have the sneaking suspicion that God is up to something. But God calls Jonah in the midst of his comfort, in the midst of his sense of the way everything is supposed to go, in the buttoned-up theology that he has, and he calls him to get up and go to in fact, through Jonah, disrupt others. To disrupt the great city of Nineveh, one of Israel's enemies, Assyria. To disrupt it. But first, Jonah has to be disrupted. What this reminds us is a painful truth that as modern day people, we don't want to grasp and we don't really want to hear that God has authority over our lives. Whether we recognize it or not, we do not belong to ourselves. And the really frightening part is that God has his own agenda that is not our agenda. It's not Jonah's agenda to maintain the status quo and comfort of our lives. God desires to disrupt us. He wants to upset our lives of ease and comfort because they actually work against his plans and his purposes for the world and for us. In fact, he's doing it right now. This very moment. And I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it's a change of location or vocation. Maybe you have some long-held conviction or attitude that he is pushing you to change. 
Maybe there is some form of security that you are holding tightly to. Or maybe it's an addiction that in your heart of hearts you don't really want to let go. I don't know exactly what the disruption is for you in this moment. But I do know that there are areas in your life just like there are in my life that we want to keep away from God's notice. That we want to hold on to control over. And God, right now, in this moment, is calling you and me to give up control in those areas. To give over control to Him. He is speaking to us in a disruptive way. Can you hear him? In our last series on the prodigal son, we talked about the way God functions using provenient grace and cooperant grace. Now, we didn't use those terms. What we did talk about was to recognize that the father allows the son to leave with the hope, of course, that the son returns. And that pointed us to the biblical theology that God hands us over to our sin life, hands us over into the power of sin, not to condemn us, but so that we will taste death and desire life desire him, and that he is gone ahead of us, working to draw us to himself. In other words, we practice good Methodist theology. If you're talking to the bishop, let him know. But there's another side to things as well. There's another type of theology Calvinism. Now, we're not Calvinists, and we are at odds a lot of time with Calvinistic theology, but we can never completely put it aside. It's important that we do pay attention to the whole witness of the church, because it does offer us something. The flip side of our theology in Calvinism is the theology of irresistible grace. At family camp this year, Bishop Cliff was there, and he did a few addresses, and in a couple of his addresses, he asked the question, or he asked us, what power is? How would you describe power? And he encouraged us to come up with a definition for the word power. I want to offer to us that that is what Calvin and Calvinists are seeking to do as they discuss a theology of irresistible grace. It is to claim and believe and assert that God is effective, able to fulfill his purposes. That there is nothing in our cooperant grace where God calls us to participate with him. There is nothing that we can do as human beings to derail God's plans and purposes. God is efficient, strong enough to fulfill his purposes. And all theology is embedded in people. And that is a very hopeful kind of theology, although we have to keep it balanced with some of our own theology. You see, there are moments in God's grace that he will run us to ground. There are moments in God's grace where he will run us to ground. This morning, I printed a poem for you that I included in your bulletin called The Hound of Heaven by Francis Thompson. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I want you to hear the beginning stanza. I fled him, 
Down the nights and down the days, I fled him. Down the arches of the years, I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears, I hid from him in under running laughter. Up vistaed hopes I sped and shot precipitated down titanic glooms of chasmed fears from those strong feet that followed, followed after. But with unhurrying chase and unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy they beat, and a voice beat more instant than the feet. All things betray thee, who betrayest me. Give it a read. But it is a description, a Jonah-like description of the way in God's grace that he pursues us. And he pursues Jonah. Jonah goes down to Joppa. Jonah goes down to the ship. Jonah goes down into the ship. Jonah goes down into sleep. Jonah is putting as much distance between him and the call of the Lord as he can possibly do. (laughs) Because not only does God disrupt, he pursues. And like that great wind that God hurls onto the sea in order to hound Jonah, God's pursuing presence is a great threat when we have determined in our hearts to flee from him, from his face. In the face of that presence pursuing us, we suddenly realize just how small and weak and futile we are in our attempts to escape. The sailors themselves are caught up in Jonah's power struggle with God, and their story foreshadows the larger story of the book, the end result of the nations coming to worship Israel's God, Yahweh. For myself, that night, I flicked the cigarette away and I headed up to bed and I lay on my back, staring up at the ceiling, unable to escape the oppressive presence that hung in the room like a cloud, letting me know that I could not escape, demanding that I respond instead. So where are you this morning? Are you in flight from God? Can you sense him hot on your heels? Can you feel his breath on your neck? Let him catch you. The secret of the Christian life is what Jesus tells us that you won't actually lose your life if you give it up, but that you will in fact gain it. All your hopes and desires will be fulfilled in ways that you cannot imagine through the filter of your fear. You see, the sailors take steps of obedience. Now, they pray because they're a little unsure Killing God's prophets tends to have some ill effects and consequences. So if you ever get the opportunity to throw a prophet of the living God into the sea, maybe pray this prayer. And they just come to terms and they say, look, we have done everything we could to spare this guy's life, but you seem determined to have him thrown into the sea So if that's what you want, it's on you, it's not on us. Please don't kill us. Here he is. 
And just like they took the wares from the bottom of the ship, they have now taken Jonah from the bottom of the ship and they throw him in offering a living sacrifice to God. And as a result, everything comes right down. And these heathens, these pagans, these worshipers of other gods suddenly know the power of the God of Israel, which is actually the God of heaven, who has made the seas and the land and all that is in them. He has control over the winds and the waves, and they offer sacrifices, and they vow vows. They worship. And Jonah takes a step of obedience. At least he puts himself back into God's hands. Throw me into the water, and I guess we'll see what happens. He gives up his escape plan. Well, that night, as I lay staring up at the ceiling, unable to get to sleep, I finally bargained with God with that thick fog, with the oppressive presence that seemed to be hounding my mind. I just needed sleep. I was convinced if I could get to sleep, I would wake up in the morning, as had happened so many times in my past, where everything would be same old, same old. I would be safe again from that presence. But that sleep would not come, so I finally said, fine, if you show yourself to me, you demonstrate that you are, that you exist, that you really want me. If this is not all just some figment of my imagination, if this isn't me just having been harassed by another stepmother, then I will worship you. And I fell asleep, and I slept well. I slept a depth of sleep that I hadn't slept in a long time. When I woke up in the morning, I felt like my sleep was tangible. It was just good. And I felt alive. I felt charged. I felt like I didn't need to walk places anymore. I just kind of floated. And everything was changed. The presence was still there, but it was no longer an oppressive thick fog. It was now a reassuring light, bright, comfortable, energizing, renewing, comforting kind of presence. See, at the center of our faith is the cross and resurrection of Jesus. To choose death, to sink beneath the waves, to allow that old self, that old comfortable status quo religious self to drown is to gain our lives truly for the first time. Often at nighttime, I'm the last one to go to bed. And as I shut things up, I do a, a mental assessment where my wife, my puppy, my children are, where they are laying their heads. And I think of you. And I think our, our life here together. I think of this vocation, this province, and that same presence of comfort and joy fills me. And I overflow with gratitude. Because I could never have anticipated this life. 21-year-old David was too stupid. Too inexperienced. Too shallow. To even dream that life could taste this sweet. That things could be this good. I didn't even have it in me to hope or imagine. I 
Are you ready this morning to let go of the comfort, the status quo? Are you ready to sing that song of Spirit lead me where my trust is without borders? To walk upon the waters wherever you might call me? To take me deeper than my feet could ever wander? all in the presence of my Savior? Are you ready to give up the thing that you think you're holding on to in order to receive this abundant life that God has in store for you and through you to the world? Let's pray. Father, again, these are risky prayers and if we are being honest with ourselves, nine out of ten times the answer is no. Is not what I want. These are not the places that I want to go. These are not the, the thoughts that I want challenged. I'm not sure that I am ready to put all my chips on you. But we can feel your grace. It's right there, right behind us, pushing up against our back, calling us to leave this religious, comfortable life in order to grab on to this living and uncomfortable, abundant life of adventure. Sometimes it takes some drastic, painful calamity to reach us. We don't pray for that. But we do pray that if you are trying to get our attention, that you give us the strength to give you to turn and to be caught. We can hear you arise, go, call. Even so, come. Amen. All right, you can stand and join us again. <clears throat> Like a covenant of old, your love is enduring. 
through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today faithful you have been faithful you will be you pledge yourself to me and that's why i sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips you father the orphan your kindness makes us whole you shoulder our weakness and your strength becomes our own you're making me like you and clothing me in white bringing beauty from ashes and for you will have your bride free of all her guilt rid of all her shame known by her true name and that's why i sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you lord you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you lord you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you lord you will be praised you will be praised with angels and saints we sing worthy are you lord that's why i sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips
What gift of love could I offer to a king? What weight of worth could be held within my offering? When he alone is worthy A glory song is inscribed upon my heart This treasure held in an alabaster jar I pray to bring him all the glory Praise God from whom all Blessings flow Praise Him all creatures Here below What sacrifice could be equal to His own the cross of Christ has declared that there is not I own. And yet I know I owe Him more. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Our Father God, the infinite, the matchless King, magnificent, the living Christ, the servant Son, the prophesied, the saving one, the Holy Ghost. Gift from above, the faithful friend, the seal of love, this life, this heart, this song to him, my all in all, my everything. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Can we say thank you to Donovan for coming back and leading us? The uh, disruptive thing about worshiping a disruptive God is that it can be very disruptive. So if you need prayer this morning, we want to invite you to stay. Just come sit near the cross and somebody will come and pray with you, whatever it is. 
Yes, God wants to disrupt you, but remember, he also comforts the disturbed. Receive this blessing. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and grant you his peace. I invite you to share a blessing with each other in person and online and go in peace.